Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. So today's video is going to be about a teenager who was abducted about four years ago, but to this day, there hasn't really been much movement in her case. I have seen this case covered by a couple of other true crime podcasts and YouTubers. However, I haven't seen anyone talk about her case in about two years, so I decided to just go ahead and cover her disappearance because this is a case that needs eyes on it. This is a case that can very possibly be solved if the right person sees it. So my goal is to have as many people as possible have this case being brought up again and seeing it if they haven't seen it yet. It is one of those cases that is very beneficial to bring to the public's awareness so people can keep an eye out for her because there's a huge possibility that this young girl is still out there somewhere. But before we get into today's case, I just wanted to go ahead and say a big thank you for today's sponsor, which is NordPass. I have spoken about NordPass in previous videos and that is because I absolutely love their service. NordPass is a password security service where security meets simplicity. NordPass is powered by the cybersecurity professionals who built NordVPN, which is an online security app that is used by many users worldwide. NordPass allows you to store all of your passwords in one secure place, all being secured by one master password. So instead of having to remember a bunch of different passwords for all of your different social medias and shopping sites, you only have to remember one single password. NordPass also helps you auto-generate very secure passwords. It can recognize suspicious websites so you can stay safe while you're browsing online so you don't accidentally reveal your personal information to the wrong sites. And my favorite part of NordPass is that it lets you shop online with ease. NordPass can help you create online accounts such as Amazon accounts, creates a secure and complex password for you so it is impossible for hackers to guess your password. And then it remembers it for you so you don't have to worry about remembering anything yourself. It also can save all of your credit card information in addition to all of your user information so it makes online shopping super easy. NordPass is also very user-friendly and easy to use, which I absolutely love because as you guys have heard me say before, I am an absolute grandmother with technology, so I definitely need something that is easy for me to use and not complex and difficult to figure out. NordPass has user-friendly apps for Android and iOS, works on desktop apps for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, plus browser extensions for Chrome, Firefox, Opera, and Edge. My life has gotten so much more easy and smooth since I started using NordPass because in the past, there's been so many times where I've gotten random email saying, you know, someone from such and such state or country is trying to log into your Twitter or your Snapchat, Instagram, or my Amazon account. And it's absolutely terrifying because I know what hackers can do to your information if they can access it, especially if they access one of your online shopping accounts. But I know that no one can get into any of my accounts because they are securely protected by NordPass. The best part about NordPass is that the service is so affordable. You can literally get an entire month's worth for less less than the cost of your daily Starbucks coffee. My subscribers can get 50% off of NordPass plus an additional month for free when you click the link below and use code Rachel. It has never been easier and more cost effective to keep all of your accounts and passwords safe and save you from huge headaches in the future. So again, make sure to go ahead and click the link below and enter code Rachel for 50% off of NordPass plus one extra month for free. Thank you again to NordPass for sponsoring today's video. So with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the unsolved disappearance of Pearl Pinson. Pearl Pinson was born December 15, 2000 in Vallejo, California to her parents, James Pinson and Joyce Mitchell. She was the middle child of two siblings, an older sister and a younger brother. She was very close to her family and especially her sister. She was described as always being so happy and sweet with such a big heart yet very feisty and strong. She would go out of her way to help others, but also did not have a problem speaking her mind and standing up to people when she needed to. She loved to ride her longboard and absolutely adored animals. She was really smart and did well in school and wanted to become either a veterinarian or a firefighter. She had a dog named Misty who she loved so much and was just overall such a kind-natured young woman. Now, typically, Pearl would walk 15 minutes to her bus stop to get to school at Jesse M. Bethel High School. Wednesday, May 25th, 2016 was no different. This day started as any other. 
15-year-old Pearl Pinson woke up and got dressed as normal, putting on a black and white zip-up hoodie, a gray sweatshirt, black pants, pink Nike turf shoes, and a black Raiders beanie. To get to school, she walked along a sidewalk that led to a pedestrian overpass over Interstate 780. However, by 7 a.m., police started receiving phone calls about a violent incident that was happening in that same area. Callers were describing a Hispanic man that had a gun, attacking a young girl and dragging her across the overpass into his car, and they said that they had heard gunshots. The caller said that this young girl was screaming for help and that she appeared bloody. The witnesses described this young girl as being a white female with dark hair carrying a black and turquoise backpack with a joker emblem on it. Some callers reported that this man was attempting to rape this woman while others said that he was abducting her. One witness said that he actually did try to intervene and help the girl but that the man just turned around and pointed a gun at him. At this point, after the gunshots were heard and it was very clear that this man had a gun and he was willing to use it, people in the area started to duck, take cover, and hide. So it wasn't totally clear what was happening, whether the man had shot the girl, whether he had shot someone else, or if he had just fired off a warning shot, but it was very clear that there was a young woman who was in grave danger. Police arrived shortly after getting these calls, but by the time they got there, both the girl and her abductor were gone. What they did see when they got there was a cell phone on the ground as well as a small amount of blood splatter. Quickly, they were able to figure out that this victim was 15-year-old Pearl Pinson using the cell phone. However, because the cell phone was left in that spot, there was no way to use it to figure out where she was taken. There were also a lot of conflicting eyewitness statements. Some people told police that this man had fled with this girl on foot, while others said that he pushed her into a car and drove away. Soon though, they were able to figure out that the victim was pushed into a car described as a 1999 gold four-door Saturn. After finding out the description of the car and the abductor, police were able to identify the potential suspect as being 19-year-old Fernando Castro. So apparently there were rumors that Pearl and Castro knew each other and were friendly with one another. Others went as far as saying as the two were dating and they were in a full-on relationship, though her family said that while they had heard his name before, it was just sort of in passing and that she only knew him as an acquaintance. They did not think that the two were dating whatsoever. But the two actually do live very close to one another. In fact, their houses are only a few blocks apart. However, after searching through Pearl's and Castro's cell phone records and social media, they didn't find anything that showed that the two had a relationship. As far as I saw, I think that they did show that the two had communicated before so that they did know each other at the very least, but it didn't point to anything towards them being an actual relationship. Now, there were no further sightings of Pearl that day, but police did spot Castro driving a few hours later after being picked up on a surveillance video. At around 9.15 a.m., Castro was seen driving westbound on Interstate 580. By 9.30, he was driving south on Interstate 101 in Marin County near the Golden Gate Bridge. This was about 25 miles away from where Pearl was abducted. So it wasn't actually until the next day, May 26th, that police actually sent out an Amber Alert for Pearl. The reason that it was delayed was because apparently there were so many conflicting witness statements that they didn't just want to jump the gun and put out something that wasn't totally accurate. Plus we know that there are very strict guidelines that they have to follow when it comes to putting out an Amber Alert because they can't put out an Amber Alert for every potential abduction if there's not enough in information because then that saturates the Amber Alert system and there's too many people to keep an eye out for. So I do understand why they didn't want to put one out right away, but according to the family, they did have enough information at the very beginning to put one out. So it's really not totally known exactly why they waited so long. But after the alert was out, people started calling in with tips saying that they saw Pearl in the area and in other states. Again though, it wasn't super helpful with these people calling in because there were so many sightings of her reported around so many different areas, and by the time that the Amber Alert was sent out 24 hours later, Pearl and her abductor could be pretty much anywhere, so they weren't exactly sure which sightings were credible and which were not. However, by 3 p.m. the same day that the Amber Alert was put out, so May 26th, 
a witness actually did spot Castro driving. He was seen in San Luis Obispo County driving south on Interstate 101, which is about four hours or 250 miles away from where Pearl was taken the previous day. After witnesses called in with the sighting, the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Office set out on their pursuit. They were actually able to catch up with Castro, and this is when they started following his car in a high-speed police chase. Eventually, Castro got off the highway in Belton and headed east on Highway 246 into Solvang into a residential area and ended up crashing into a barricade in the Rancho San Yez mobile estate. After this, Castro got out of his car and ran into one of the nearby mobile homes. After he ran in, the person who lived there ran out, of course, absolutely terrified. Castro then ran out of the mobile home and started to attempt to steal a truck while firing his gun at police who were on scene. He was able to get into the truck and start driving away, but he was still firing the gun at police as he was doing so, so police fired back and they actually did eventually hit and kill Castro. At this point, police still didn't know if Pearl had been inside of Castro's car when they started this whole chase. No one had been seen inside of his car, but she could have been hiding on the floor or in the trunk or something like that. So then after the firing had stopped and the situation was a little bit more de-escalated, police went over to look at the truck that Castro was now in and had tried to steal and confirmed that Castro was in fact deceased. So now the man who took Pearl and the only man who knew where she was or what happened to her was now dead and could no longer give any answers. Then police checked Castro's car to see if Pearl was in there and she was not. Now, after examining Castro's car, they did find a small amount of blood and after examining it, it was matched to Pearl. But it was said to have matched the injuries that Pearl was seen with by witnesses at the time of her abduction and there was not enough blood in the car to tell if Pearl was seriously injured or if she had been killed, the amount of blood that was found showed very minor injuries. This made police believe that Pearl was alive at that point and made them believe that she very well could come home alive. So now the thought was that maybe Castro handed Pearl off to someone else and so they started looking into his record to see if they could figure out maybe who his associates were what his past criminal history was like and things like that. But as far as I have seen and the articles that I have read, Castro had almost zero criminal history. He only had a few very minor charges and according to those that police had questioned, he didn't seem to have any sort of mental health issues or anything like that in the past. He was not known as someone who used drugs or had a drug problem or a drinking problem. Some witnesses said that he could be involved in gang activity, but others said that they know he wasn't and it could not be confirmed whether he was involved in that kind of activity or not. So on the surface, it looks like Castro has no criminal history and is not involved in any criminal activity. So police did some more digging to see if they could figure out why this man just decided to kidnap this random 15 year old girl. Now, when police had searched his home, they found a receipt with handwritten notes on it that included directions to Jenner, California, which is a small coastal town 65 miles away from Vallejo. Additionally, using cell phone data, police did find out that Castro had been in Jenner at some point after Pearl's abduction. Then using CCTV footage, police spotted Castro at a gas station in Bodega Bay, which is about 10 miles from Jenner, the day after Pearl was taken. However, they did not see any sign of Pearl in this footage. At this point, police and the FBI were searching so many different areas for Pearl. They used helicopters, they searched on foot, they searched different bodies of water, but they weren't finding much. By Saturday, May 28th, 65 law enforcement officers searched a 25 mile radius around Jenner, but they didn't find anything. They did put out a notice for people to keep on the lookout for Pearl's distinctive black and turquoise backpack because that could lead them to exactly where Pearl is. Again, at this point, they did believe that Pearl was still alive, but they were having a hard time figuring out where to search because of how far Castro had traveled. Like I said, he was spotted 250 miles away from where she was abducted. He had connections to Jenner. Police even thought that he could have handed her off to a completely different person in a completely different state. So they continued to search over the next few months in as many different areas as they possibly could, but 
they were coming up with absolutely nothing. The family continued to ask the public for information and tips. They put out flyers with her photo on it and tried to do whatever they could to keep her name and story alive. There was a $10,000 reward put out for information leading to finding Pearl, but still, none of this really led to much. And that is pretty much where the case sits today. Most of the articles that I could find on Pearl's abduction were from 2016 and 2017, and any article that I could find from 2018 and beyond were pretty much just saying that the family is holding out hope that Pearl is still alive out there and that they're still looking for answers. But with every year that passes without finding Pearl, it is just increasingly difficult for them to keep holding out hope. The family is incredibly frustrated that police shot the one and only man who had answers about Pearl's whereabouts, but police have come out and said that they tried their best to take him alive, but they had no choice but to return fire when Castro started firing at them first. He very possibly could have seriously injured an officer or an innocent standbyer. So it is understandable how and why it happened the way that it did, but it would be dishonest to say that it's not incredibly frustrating and that this case would have probably had a very, very much different outcome had he still been alive. So at this point, it's pretty safe to say that Castro is in fact the person who abducted Pearl. However, it is unknown as to why he did it or if she's still alive and out there and being held in captivity or if he took her life. Like I mentioned before, there's absolutely no evidence that Castro is into any sort of gang activity or drug activity or drug trafficking, and he has a very clean record. And as far as I've seen to this day, police have said that there's absolutely no evidence that he took Pearl's life, so they believe that it's very possible still that she is alive and out there somewhere. With that being said, there are a few possible theories as to what could have happened to Pearl. So the first theory is that maybe Castro and Pearl actually knew each other a little bit better than everyone thought, and that this entire thing happened either because he tried making more romantic or sexual advances on her and she turned him down, or that maybe they were already in a relationship and had a huge fight or falling out or something that caused Castro to act out. Now, like I said, there were rumors that the two were romantically involved. Now, I will say that obviously rumors are not always true and do not always have any backing whatsoever, but they do usually start from somewhere. And in this case, it very possibly could have been that people heard the two names and thought that you know, maybe they had been together, or maybe people had thought that they really did see them together. I don't know, but maybe they did know each other and maybe they just didn't want anyone to know. Now, just as a side note, and this may not be an opinion that everyone agrees with, but it is something that I do feel very strongly about. Pearl was only 15 years old and Fernando Castro was 19 years old. The age of consent in California, as far as I have seen, is in fact 16. So, if the two were sexually involved, that makes Castro guilty of statutory rape. That is a fact. Now, where my opinion comes in is that I don't care what the age of consent is. I don't care if it's even younger than that. There's a lot of states where it is younger than that. A legal adult, especially one who has already graduated high school, has absolutely no business being involved with a younger teenager. Now, obviously, I know they're are exceptions. I don't want anyone in the comments saying, well, you know, what if he's 18 and graduated and she's only 17 and she only has one year left of school? Obviously, that is very different, even if it's a year or two years. But when you are a teenager, four years is a huge age gap. I think if they did have a relationship, it's totally wrong. And I don't think it should be considered a relationship. I think it should be considered him being predatory towards a younger girl. So, if they were in a relationship together, he has a lot of reason to want to hide that relationship because it is wrong. And maybe he knew that. Maybe he knew that it didn't look good that him as an adult was dating a freshman in high school. So maybe they had been seeing each other secretly and she dumped him or stopped talking to him or ghosted him or something like that. Maybe they got into a fight and maybe he just blew up. Or maybe the two really did know each other as acquaintances and just knew each other in passing, and then he made more romantic again or sexual advances towards her, and she rejected him. Either way, maybe that morning he tried to get her to come with him, tried to 
you know, get her into his car, even threatening her with a gun. And then she refused and he tried to drag her in. But then this just got completely out of control and it all happened from there the way that we know it did. The frustrating thing again is that after getting into his car, we have absolutely no idea what could have happened. So maybe he took her to a different location and took her life. Maybe he gave her to someone else who is now holding her captive still. However, with this theory in particular, it doesn't seem likely that he would be able to hand her off to someone because if this is just a heat of the moment thing, he just randomly, you know, got angry and hurt this girl. It's hard to imagine that he would just have someone on retainer that he could just take this young girl to and give her to whenever he felt like it. And I also just want to throw it out there that it's possible that he harmed her in a way that didn't cause her to bleed very much. So that's definitely something to keep in mind as you consider this. But again, we don't know. The next theory is very similar to the first theory, but rather than them knowing each other in passing at all and having a relationship, maybe Castro just noticed Pearl around town. Maybe he saw her on her daily walk to school, learned her route, and planned this entire thing to stalk her and eventually take her or try to make advances towards her or something like that. Maybe it was just this day that he had decided to take her or again, try to lure her or get her to come with him willingly. And obviously it did not go as planned and she fought back and made a scene. I feel like this possibility is a little bit more likely than them already knowing each other and him making advances mostly because of when she was actually taken. She was taken on her walk to school in broad daylight at seven in the morning. I feel like if the two had already known each other or been in a relationship and he made advances that it wouldn't have happened in the morning like that. I feel like it would have happened in the evening or on a date or when she was at his house after school. That type of thing usually happens when people are hanging out or when she's heading over to the guy's house or something like that. So it just seems a little bit random that if they did get into a fight that he just decided to take her on her way to school when people would be expecting her in broad daylight with other people right there. So to me, in terms of what makes the most logistical sense, I think that if Castro had been stalking her and maybe he did know her in passing, maybe she just seen him around, but he was a lot more interested in her than he was in him. So he had been secretly stalking her and she just thought that he was walking by once in a while. Maybe he knew her route to school, but didn't necessarily know where she lived. He could have felt that this was the best time to take her on her way to school when he already knew where she would be and when. The last theory is that Pearl was taken and put into human trafficking. This is definitely the most widely believed theory and the theory that the family and police have said is a very high possibility. So obviously we know that Castro was driving around to a bunch of different places and had written notes pointing to specific places that he had been seen in. Plus, police have stated that they have not found any evidence that points towards Pearl being deceased and they believe that it's very possible that she was handed off to another person. So it's possible that since the day she was taken up until now, she has been passed back and forth from person to person, probably going to all sorts of different places to keep her hidden and is being held captive against her will. I do think it's possible that Castro was involved with human trafficking, even though he wasn't necessarily involved with gangs or drugs as far as we know. From what I have learned in looking into true crime cases and just following the news and just knowing about this topic in general, it's relatively easy for human traffickers to stay under the radar. They are very skilled at what they do and they would do anything to conceal it. Oftentimes the people taking the girls or boys or children off the streets are normal looking people that have probably normal jobs that don't look threatening whatsoever. They're not who you would think. They're not this big, scary, tough looking guy that a lot of people picture when they think of human trafficking. They're not these big gross men that look like you know they traffic people they look completely normal and they would do anything to conceal what they're doing. So when I think about the police shootout, it does not seem like Castro was expecting to get out of that alive. If he was involved in trafficking, 
first of all, that is a very, very serious thing to get caught up with. Not only would he go to jail for the rest of his life, but there's probably a really big underlying ring that he probably knows about and is involved in. And if he went to jail and he let any information out, or even if the people he worked with suspected him of ratting, he could be in a lot of danger. He could have already basically been expecting to die because he got caught. So his actions show me that he really did not have anything else to lose. He started shooting at these officers right away. And when you do that, you know that you're probably not likely to get out of it alive. So I think that he again felt like he had absolutely nothing to use. And that is why he just went out there guns blazing like that. I think that it says a lot that she's never been found and there's never been any evidence found whatsoever. Plus, She's 15 years old and she is a very, very beautiful young woman. She is a prime target for these disgusting predators, not only because of her looks, but because she walked alone to school every single day. It would have been easy for someone to spot her, learn her schedule, figure out that she does walk alone, and eventually take her. Plus, I will say in a lot of cases that I've looked up to that I thought maybe human trafficking could be involved, a lot of the times, police does not suspect human trafficking, or at least they won't say it out loud. So the fact that in this case, police have come out and said that they believe it's possible, that's huge. Human trafficking is a massive problem all around the world, including the US. It is a much bigger problem than people believe, and California has some of the highest rates of human trafficking due to its massive economy, massive population, and location right next to the southern border. So it's a lot easier to get someone and get out of the country. According to the National Human Trafficking Hotline, 10,949 cases of human trafficking were reported in the United States in 2018, with 1,656 cases being in California. That is more than 15% of the country's reported cases, which is pretty significant, but it's even more significant when you ponder all of the cases that have not been reported. These are just the cases that have been reported, but we know that there's a possibility of so many more cases that we just don't know about. Stephanie Harlow made an amazing video all about human trafficking a few weeks or months ago, so I will link that down below because I think what she said is very, very important to understand, and I think it is a very, very well put together video. Pearl's family has come out and said that they do believe that she is alive, they do believe that she's being trafficked, and they will not believe any differently until there's actual proof. The best thing to do right now is to just spread Pearl's case like wildfire and get her picture out there. Make people remember her face because if she is out there and she is being trafficked, if enough people see her face, she will be recognized. I'm very confident in that. All we need to do is put her face and her story out there and her case very well could be solved. I definitely think that it's possible. It's what I'm hoping. And as I always say, feel free to share this video or share any of the other videos made about Pearl. And I have a lot of articles listed below, so feel free to share any of those as well. Pearl was 15 years old at the time of her disappearance and would be turning 20 years old in December of this year. She was five feet, three inches tall and weighed 130 pounds. Pearl has green eyes and her naturally brown hair was dyed turquoise at the time of her disappearance and she has a pierced lip. She was wearing a black and white zip up hoodie, a gray sweater or sweatshirt, black pants, Nike turf shoes that were black, pink, and white, and a black Raiders beanie. She was carrying a distinctive black and turquoise backpack with the Joker emblem on it. Anyone with information about the case can call the Solano County Sheriff's tip line on 707-784-1963, 7 .7 or you can call the 24 tip line that is being monitored by a private investigator at 707 707- 421-7090. I have also linked the Find Pearl Pinson Facebook page for anyone who wishes to stay updated with Pearl's case. Thank you guys so much for listening to Pearl's story, and now I want to hear your guys' thoughts in the comments. Do you think that she's still alive out there? Do you think that Fernando Castro has trafficked her, or do you think that he took her life? please let me know in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. 
Don't forget to follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. Also, don't forget to go ahead and give NordPass a try to help protect your passwords and enhance your online security. Click the link down below and use code Rachel to get 50% off of NordPass plus an extra month for free. Also, if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to go ahead and send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. Every single case that I cover here on my channel is taken directly from that email, so please do not hesitate to send your suggestions over. With that, I hope you guys have a great week, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!